And we are back on Inside the Ropes, and our guest tonight was with us for our end of year specials last year, and we kind of have a little bit of a connection because Inside the Ropes celebrated our 100th uh, show la- two weeks ago, and this man uh, is the editor of a magazine which is arguably the best wrestling magazine in the world, and it celebrated its 100th issue, uh, which is a course fighting spirit magazine, and we have the editor with us tonight, Mr. Brian Elliott. Brian, welcome back. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, congratulations on a hundred, a hundred uh, issues of the magazine, and and you still have hair on your head at the end of it. Uh, well, I'll probably have to update my profile pic on Facebook and things like that. But uh, yeah, there's still some there. It's a bit grayer though. <laughs> That's to be expected. Um, and yet, there's, I mean, FSM's kind of uh, come on leaps and bounds. I remember buying the first issue back. Oh, it must have been like 2006, I think it was. Yeah, uh, something like that. And it was kind of one of those things of like, I think a lot of wrestling fans, when you see a new magazine, you might not immediately be hooked by it and buy it every month because it's new. But, it, you know, as time went on, I found myself buying it more and more and more and more and more. Um, so, I mean, it must be pretty pretty exciting to be a part of something that's kind of reached a pinnacle and you've got guys like Jim Cornette and Magnus and Bill Apter being a part of it as well. Well, it's just nice that people like the magazine, of course. Uh, it's... There's been sort of different permutations of it. The first two editors, there have been three editors in total of of Fighting Spirit magazine since 2006. The first two uh, came from a video games background, believe it or not, Um, even though they had tremendous knowledge of of pro wrestling and mixed martial arts. uh, But they came from a video games background, so the uh, content of the magazine, I think, kind of reflected that a little more. Um, I really come from a, a, a sports writing background in uh, in sports departments of newspapers and things like that. So um, I think perhaps that is reflected in the coverage that you get in FSM now. We're here to talk about 2013. And I guess before we kind of talk about various things, something has literally just broken in the past few hours um, when we were recording this. Um, Jeff Jarrett has tweeted that he has resigned from Impact Wrestling or TNA Entertainment, as he called it. Um, what do you make of this news from it coming out? Well, let's work on the assumption first that it is news and not an angle. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Do we work honestly, on that assumption? But yeah, the, the truth is I haven't, I haven't made any call, uh, phone calls about it yet, um, just for uh, working on various other things. So uh, after I speak uh, with you, I'll, I'll probably be doing that uh, this evening and uh, just working out what's true and what's not. I mean, it's <sighs> Jeff uh, was obviously a founding father of TNA, um, with his own father, Jerry Jarrett, and uh, he took on more of the mantle as uh, he and uh, he and his father, actually their their uh, relationship as father and son broke down, and uh, J- uh, Jeff took on uh, more responsibilities for TNA. But in any case, um, after uh, Jeff ended up, uh, after he married Karen Angle, if you recall, that was... They all tried to make that into into a storyline, but yeah. um, when Jeff Jarrett uh, became involved with her, there's a famous story of how Dixie Carter asked him up front, you know, is there something going on between you and Karen? And he said no, allegedly. And uh, of course, something was going on behind the scenes. They ended up uh, very happily married. And uh, But that uh, that kind of broke a trust issue between Dixie and Jeff, and he hadn't been around uh, TNA for, for quite some time. He was doing other stuff like Ring Cat King and, and things like that. But he had been back in... Uh, TNA doing some sort of agent work and um, had some interjection on what was happening in creative uh, because Eric Bischoff and Bruce Pritchard had left their posts there. So I don't know. um, You always take these things with a pinch of salt when it comes to wrestling, especially the TNA guys on Twitter. Um, They they are more inclined to stay with storyline than even the WWE guys. So um, I would treat that with caution so far. If there were to be an angle uh, based on you know Dixie doing the heel owner of TNA, um, there's there's a fairly good chance that Jeff Jarrett would be involved in that as the person or one of the founding fathers of TNA. So it may well be storyline. Yeah, for sure. And I guess to kind of to just kind of finish off that sort of blurring storylines, um, one thing that we've kind of covered in the show that um, people just seem to be very skeptical about is the whole AJ Styles situation and. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a, there was a, he put out the statement basically saying, you know, thank you, God, thank you, Jesus, I'm going to go where I want to go. And um, Bill Behrens has put out that he, they're still negotiating positively with TNA. I mean, most people seem to think that AJ will end up back in TNA, but it's just a case of the money's not been right yet. Um, from what you know, and, and what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Do you see him going back there in the near future? 
Yeah, I think he'll be back. Uh, it may take a little while, but I think he'll be back. And it's really just a case of, you know, TNA is the best place for him. Um, you know, AJ is more than talented enough to go to WWE, uh, be, be put on pay-per-view and have great matches, you know, on pay-per-view, on TV, wherever they decide to put him. He's, if he went to WWE, he'd be, I'm sure, in the top five workers there uh, in terms of in terms of putting on matches. The thing is, would they allow him to go there and do that? You know, he would not have the power to go into negotiations and say, well, I don't want to go to developmental. That would be, you know, it sounds ridiculous that WWE would stick AJ Styles in developmental, but we've seen some other pretty ridiculous stuff uh, from them. And he wouldn't have, I don't think he would have the bargaining power to go in there and, you know, sort of demand that uh, he would go on the main roster. And even if he did, you know, that sort of thing would not be looked at well. But over in WWE, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, the return of The Rock for the, the for 2013. Um, when he came back on the first Raw of 2013 and did the program with CM Punk, and then the the match with John Cena at WrestleMania, um, how how would you compare it to the, the 2012 returns that he had? Uh, do you think it was effective? And did you enjoy his his run in 2013? Well, it was effective because WrestleMania did over a million buys. That's uh, I know that there were some people in WWE who were slightly disappointed that it didn't break uh, the number that was for WrestleMania 28, and in fact didn't break the the all-time pay-per-view number for WWE. But um, you, you, that's just an incredible number, a million buys at uh, what is it like sixty-five dollars? It's for HD, yeah. so that's um, you know that's an incredible amount of money. So it's got to be just a success on those terms. Um, whether it was a success critically. Well, you know, that's going to be subjective to me personally, you know, having seen The Rock for all these years and, you know, been through the Attitude Era uh, with him and, and seen him so often through that. Uh, to me, when he came back, it was like a Rock's greatest hits, certainly on the on you know the microphone. And it's kind of stuff that I've heard it all before. Uh, there wasn't um, I think there, were, there was a few new catchphrases that really didn't click with with me as you know someone who's in their 30s and perhaps they weren't supposed to but um you know and in terms of the matches uh i think there was a lot of excitement for the match with cm punk that was raw rumble i believe Mm -hmm. um and uh obviously that built to the big match with wrestlemania uh at wrestlemania with john cena as well rock was so massive like literally in, in terms of body size so big when he came back probably bigger than he's ever been i can't help but think that it hindered him slightly in the ring um you know that uh, he is getting older of course but the sort of uh agility and smoothness that we saw from the rock at his at his peak uh, perhaps in the early 2000s maybe uh, late 90s wasn't quite there but you know as sort of a kind of epic kind of matches wwe style kind of matches um, if you're a fan of the way current uh, uh, WWE wrestling is, then I'm sure you were really uh, impressed with The Rock and really enjoyed his comeback. And I guess we should also talk about, uh, in 2013, British wrestling has has just been phenomenal. Um, you know, no matter whether you're down in Preston or you're up in Glasgow for, for ICW. Um, what, what have been your kind of favourite uh, British moments of 2013 that have happened? Ooh, moments in particular. Um, I try and watch as much British wrestling as possible. You can imagine how it's difficult with um, WWE, TNA, New Japan, the rest of Japan, UFC, Bellator. <laughs> so I watch as I tend to watch almost everything on DVD. I don't get to as many live events as I would like to. Um, but like, in, uh, there's been plenty of great matches for sure. And I think what the cool thing about British wrestling. Uh, is at the moment is uh, people always want to compare and say, ah, oh, you know, uh, it should be back on TV. You know, I think people want it to be, you know, 1964 again, and it's never going to. You, you can't turn back the, the clock like that. You have to remember that um, six years before British wrestling went off the air, there were still only three television channels in the UK. So you know that just gives you an idea of how things have changed. But um, at the level that it's at, which admittedly is kind of a niche level at the moment, there are so there is so much good wrestling happening. We mentioned Preston City Wrestling there, uh, ICW. There's Premier British Wrestling, Progress Wrestling, Southside Wrestling, NGW, Future Shock. I'm going to leave somebody out, and they're going to kill me. But um, you know, there's so much <laughs> there's so uh, there's so much good stuff. So um, of course, uh, uh, there's. Um, IPW UK and uh, Revolution Pro as well, and all these uh, all these companies are you know producing DVDs and 
and they're bringing over these great uh, great wrestlers and having them battle against the uh, UK guys more often than not. And um, you know you can watch as much wrestling as, um, as much great wrestling from the UK as, as you like. I think if if you only wanted to watch British wrestling and were happy to pay for the DVDs instead of uh, paying for your Sky Sports subscription, um, then you'd be more than satisfied throughout a year. And um, and I guess kind of we should now talk about um, some of your favorite matches of 2013. You mentioned uh, sort of New Japan there. Um, what else in Japan this year has kind of caught your eye? Uh, again, the ma- matches between Tanahashi and Okada were incredible. There was matches in uh, January, April, o- uh, August for the G1, and October. And I think possibly the one that I liked the best may have been the one, bizarrely, that didn't have the conclusive finish because it was the G1 where the match went to the draw. And, you know, that's it was one of the best matches I've ever seen. And if it had have had a finish just to, you know, complete the circle, so to speak, then, you know, you'd probably be looking at sort of the top 10 matches I've ever seen. Okay, so I've now got some notes of what to go and watch. So from, uh, I'll send from you today. my notes. Yeah, yeah, do. Because I, I, I keep saying I'm going to check it out and I just never get around to it. So I am making a, a plan to do it this time around. And sp- speaking of British wrestling, um, a couple of, couple of British matches that stand out to you from this year? Well, there were tons, like, like lots of different uh, British matches from various different companies. Um, Southside Wrestling in particular is one group that I really like. Um, I really like the style of wrestling and the pacing and the guys that they bring in. And um, Probably my favourite match of the year from Britain was uh, Mark Haskins against Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, that must have been somewhere in the, middle of, in the middle of the year. I actually forget the name of the show. But... Uh, yeah, that was a great match, and that was kind of almost like the evolution of, of, of World of Sport type of wrestling with, you know, just a few strikes thrown in, you know, just sort of uh, to mm-hmm. give it that more modern-day feel. But these guys, it was it was like a, a, a mat-based wrestling, lots of transitions, um, and it was kind of sort of like uh, believable in that wrestling kind of way, you know, it, uh, in terms of suspension of disbelief you could believe that this was a contest between two guys who were uh who are incredibly skilled and were at the peak of their careers so that was really good stuff in terms of other matches uh i was thinking of i i saw uh, a really great match at uh, ngw between sticks and nathan cruz a while back uh prince david had an incredible match with ricochet that i actually personally haven't seen but everybody uh who went to that show for revolution pro wrestling uh, told me that it was incredible, so I look forward to seeing the DVD of that one. Um, I know that uh, as I was polling on Twitter earlier on uh, for ICW, people somebody mentioned uh, Cole Cabana against Grado, and of course they had done those great vignettes prior to the match. So how about uh, going back over to the states with uh, with TNA? Um, what is what have been the kind of couple of uh, match highlights that stick out to you? Is the thing we're mentioning sort of AJ Styles earlier on and uh, him? You know, seemingly not a part of TNA uh, at this very moment. Although, like I say, I do believe he he will be again in 2014. But you know, he was such a, a major player for for matches. And I think the main one that stands out to me was the Slammiversary match with Kurt Angle. Yeah, it was a tremendous match. And AJ, of course, has had great matches with, excuse me, uh, Magnus as well. Um, and I think he had a match was it Bobby Roode as well in the um, um, in the Bound for Glory series. Yeah. So uh, yeah, AJ. You know, no surprise that he's having uh, great matches. Another one we mentioned, I'm just mentioning Bound for Glory there. Uh, Kurt Angle's return match with Bobby Roode, again, was excellent. It was kind of a slow burner, but it told a good story, and uh, it was, I thought it was a great match. And, of course, the one that surprised everybody uh, a little bit was uh, Gail Kim against uh, Taryn Terrell. I think that was lockdown. Um, and, uh, and I guess there's been a lot of debate between WWE and TNA fans as to whether those matches were better or matches between Caitlin and AJ or Natalia and AJ were better. I probably prefer, I think probably the best one I saw was, um, oh goodness, which of the AJ matches would I choose between? I'm not sure. I have to say I prefer the two WWE matches to the Gil Kim Taron Terrell match, but that's not to say anything uh, bad about it uh, any, any way whatsoever. It was a phenomenal effort, in fact, and um, that's that's a, more, uh, a match worth checking out in DVD if you haven't yet. Um and yeah, so so WWE to to kind of finish off uh, some of the matches. Um, I mean, there, this has been a a great year for wrestling matches in WWE. Um, 
and ironically because of Raw in some in certain ways. Yeah, it's it's, it's a, a weird irony that the shows have been so exhausting, but they've had some <laughs> matches. Um, I before before you kind of mention yours, one that kind of popped into my mind was I loved the match that RVD and Jericho had that went mm-hmm. over like three segments. I think it was went like twenty two minutes or something. Yeah, I believe it wasn't. The- uh, supposed to happen that way and one of the previous segments I think went a few minutes long and rather than um, sort of rush the next segment or rush the match between Jericho and RVD, they stripped whatever the next segment would have been and basically at, at Gorilla um, which is just for those who don't know, that's just backstage um, before you go through the curtain it was decided that Jericho and RVD would get those extra minutes so what you actually saw there um, in, in quite some part, was uh, a match that was called in the ring um, for for a large part of it, which isn't something that's, that that always happens, especially for TV matches. So um, yeah, that was uh, that was quite the thing to see a match go so long, and you know it was great to see two veterans do that and have a fantastic match. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so what else in WWE was? I, I'm I'm positive that the Shield and Daniel Bryan are going to come up in this, but um, what have been your kind of favorite WWE matches from this year? Yeah, Daniel Bryan is, is, is really up there uh, in particular. The Shield have done some some great stuff, especially on Raw, um, and you know most recently with uh, the Rhodes family. But um, I think if I was to you know, put a gun to my head and, tell, and ask what uh, my WWE match of the year and perhaps even my worldwide match of the year, you may well be looking at uh, Punk and Cena from February this year. Um, that was on Raw. It was just an outstanding match, so good in fact that um, in the days thereafter, WWE put up the full match, including what happened during the commercials uh, on their YouTube site. Uh, they're probably taking it down by now, but um, yeah, that was just a, a tremendous match. You know, in terms of great match, uh, great cards, that one for WWE, I think most people would turn around and say that SummerSlam was the best show of the year, and that had two really sensational matches on it. Uh, Brock Lesnar against CM Punk, which had had a really good build up before it, um, you know, with Heyman and Punk in particular, and sort of. Uh, Lesnar sort of brooding in the background. Um, that was just a, a, an incredible match, a pretty a pretty violent match. And uh, actually, I probably I know a lot of people prefer, preferred Lesnar and Punk, but I have to say I think uh, maybe Daniel Bryan against John Cena from the same evening um, uh, did it even more so for me. That was a tremendous match. Indeed, indeed. So before we let you go, Brian, uh, and thank you for being so generous with your time and coming back on and talking to us. Um, how can people get their hands on FSM? How can they get in touch with you and look at your, read your lovely Twitter musings? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe just, maybe just don't read it at, you know, two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, next week, it'll be the 27th um, when it's in the shops. Uh, normally, it'll be, out on, normally the way the dates run, it will be normally be Boxing Day. But uh, you'll probably be hard pressed to find uh, a shop, a news agency that's open on Boxing Day. So on the 27th, there's issue 101 uh, of FSM, and uh, obviously there's going to be plenty of uh, stuff in there. You'll find that issue in W. H. Smiths and Easons in the UK and Ireland. Otherwise, you can check out uh, www.fightingspiritmagazine.co.uk. Um, there is the print edition, as I've just mentioned. There's also uh, a digital edition for uh, iPhone, iPad, and Android. So uh, you can search uh, for those in your uh, Play Store or on iTunes. Um, the app uh, does have a charge of uh, £1.99, but you do get a free issue with that. So once you buy the app, you're able to get a free issue, and you can check us out that way. And uh, that are, those are the main ways to uh, to uh, pick up FSM. If you've got any questions, uh, whether it's about FSM itself or just relating to pro wrestling or mixed martial arts, uh, you can send me a tweet at FSM underscore editor. Well, Brian, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a good Christmas and a great new year. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, hopefully speaking to you again in 2014. Well, thank you very much. And Merry Christmas, everybody.